Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake, Jr. from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and this is Living Answers for Today. I'm here tonight to answer questions about the Word of God, to help with problems that you might be facing in Christian life, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that He's the answer to the complex problems you face today. If you don't know Him, if you'll examine your life, you'll have to admit something's missing. You might have millions of dollars. You might not have anything. You might have to think a new house is the answer or a new person. It's a relationship with the God that created you. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship with a living God that comes through meeting his son, Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, he's going to be knocking at the door of your heart tonight. He said, I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and feast with that person, and that person will feast with me. Knowing Jesus Christ is the relationship that creates eternal life. The Bible says as many as received him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says he that has the Son, referring to Jesus, the S-O-N, the Son of God, has life. And he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. I had religion until I was 19. And then I met Jesus Christ, and he totally changed my life. And I've seen him change thousands of lives over the past many years. He's a life-changing God. And again, if you meet him, he will revolutionize your life. We have questions that have been mailed in. This is a live Bible question and answer program. But again, Pastor Mark is here, and you can put live questions in the comment section on, on either Facebook or YouTube. And Pastor Mark will copy them down and get them to me, and we'll We'll insert the live ones with the many questions that have been sent in by email. I mentioned last week I was going to discuss something about marriage and divorce, and I didn't get to it, and I apologize for it at the end of the program. So I have it laid out here to get to it about the third or fourth program, because I think it's very important because people are put a lot of people under, a, under condemnation, and that's absolutely wrong. So I do want to discuss that again tonight. But I'm getting to this. Whosoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That's what Jesus said. Why explain this? Because if you if you have that attitude towards someone, you're full of pride. And the devil's sin was pride. I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will sit in the congregation of the Most High. I will be like the Most High. And pride caused him to fall. And pride is a very dangerous <laughs> sin. Okay, Very dangerous sin. It has been called by some authors the chief of sins because that's what led the fall of Satan to be cast out of heaven. And we can get so proud of ourselves, what we've done, what we've accomplished. No, what God accomplishes through us is the important thing. Okay. And then I have another question here. This is, uh, uh, this is something that comes frequently. Uh, I would get asked this question when we did the live radio program for 24 years live on TV. And, of course, there you just push the button and people would ask the question and you would discuss it. But how can God be both three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet one God? Or else people would call and say, please explain the Trinity. And when I first started doing the program, my wife was doing it with me and she was sitting there. And I would say, I can't explain her, yet alone the Trinity. You see, I know the Bible clearly teaches God is three persons, and yet there is one God. I know that blows every fuse I have in my head to try to explain it. I can't do it, but I know it's true. Uh, for instance, in Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God made man in his image. Male and female created he them. John chapter 1, in the beginning was, in beginning was the word. I'm actually quoting the original Greek text. In beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, indicating two separate persons, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, God was the word is actually what it says. In other words, the one called the, the word is identical in character and nature as the one called the God, but he's a different person, and yet there's one God, and then there is God, the Holy Spirit, all one God. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God's Son, okay, the Spirit of the Father. So, yes, God is one in three persons. God the Son is, is, is currently standing on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, and yet he is one. 
It's like when Jesus said in John 14, I'm going away. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, another helper to come alongside. And a verse later, he says, by the way, I'm coming with him. And then two verses later, he says, the Father and I are coming with him. God the Son has only one time ever been separated from the Father. John chapter 1, Jesus said this, No man has seen God, referring to the Father, at any time. The unique God, the one continuous existing in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. That means every appearance of God throughout history where people have seen God, it's always been God the Son. But it says that the Son of God is continually existing in the bosom of the Father. Now, God the Son laid aside the form of God. He didn't lay aside his deity. He laid aside his form and took upon himself the form of a human being and became human, but he never stopped being God. 100% God, 100% man. A helpless baby laying in a stone feeding trough. 100% God, 100% man. A little be a carpenter in the carpenter shop. 100% 100% God, 100% man. Doing his miraculous ministry, 100% God, 100% man. Always in the bosom of the Father in connection with him. That blows every fuse I have in my head. Yet even when they put him on the whipping post and shredded him, he was existing in the bosom of the Father. 100% God, 100% man. When they nailed him to the cross, he was existing in the bosom of the Father. Until that awful moment, when he cried, Ali, Ali, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? For the first time in eternity, the father and son were separated. Now, how that could happen, I don't know. I can't explain that, but it did, because he had to die physically and spiritually for our sin. Okay, he paid the full bill for our sin. Adam and Eve, you know, when they sinned, physical death was pronounced on them. And then the spiritual death, they were put out of the Garden of Eden, separated from God. And we suffer spiritual death when we walk away from God as little children. All we like sheep have gone astray. But he had to die both. Now, it didn't last long. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit when he said, it is finished. In other words, it was done. The whole price was paid. And that that relationship was restored. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the old... He, he made the way into the presence of God for us. Now, I don't understand how all that can happen, but it did. But I know the Bible clearly teaches that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet there is one God, three persons, God the Son standing on the right hand of the Father in heaven right now, making intercession for us. As I've said before, it blows every fuse in my head, but that is clearly what the Bible teaches. I can't comprehend how God could speak and create a billion times a billion worlds. I can't comprehend how God, Jesus, baptized me in the Holy Spirit. I can't comprehend how God heals, but yet he does. I can't comprehend anything about God, only what he chooses to show me in his word. So I take it at face value. There's a lot of things I don't understand, okay? And that's one thing. I tell the congregation frequently, the Trinity blows every fuse I have in my head, but I know it's true. That's why some people deny it, because they can't understand it. But it is true. It absolutely is true. Okay. Okay, the third question, I'm going to talk about the marriage and divorce and remarriage thing. Okay. It says, on a daily basis, I have Christians who tell me God has communicated directly with them. Out of curiosity... Has God ever told you anything? For example, did God tell you to vote for Trump? Did he tell you to vote for those who want to force rape women, children to give birth? How far are you, how are you willing to go if God told you to do something? For example, would you hijack a plane and fly it into a building if God told you to? Now, we know that Muslims did that, okay, on 9-11. Why? Because they're convinced the only assurance of heaven is to get killed while they're conducting jihad against the enemy. That's why they're willing to blow themselves up. But it's, it's not even the Quran that tells them to do that. It's their leaders. But, but, but yes, God can definitely, absolutely speak to us, okay? But God leads us and guides you. Talk about elections. I tell people, you look at how people voted and what people passed as law and, and what side they took, and you vote according to the Bible. You read the Bible, you vote according to that. 
I don't tell people who to vote for. God doesn't tell me who to vote for. He gives me some common sense, okay, to look at the issues I agree with and the issues I don't agree with. But God has told me so many, many things over the years. Okay, just a few illustrations, all right? Uh, when I was when I got out of the army in the Korean War, I knew I was called to preach and I should go to a Bible college. And uh, the Holy Spirit, God kept directing me to go to Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. Well, I, I was in Detroit and my pastor in Detroit would have students come from Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri and preach. And most of them that came up were terrible preachers. Now, you're talking about the 1950s, folks, okay? Not talking about today. They were terrible preachers. I remember one stood up in front of the congregation one Sunday and said, today I am preaching what is called a homiletical sermon, and this is Roman numeral one. I thought, God, they're a bunch of, they're a bunch of parrots. I don't want to be a parrot. And God kept telling me Central Bible College, and I kept saying, I don't want to be a parrot. And then I heard a speaker from Great Lakes Bible Institute in Zion, Illinois, Hardy Steinberg, who was the president of that college, one of the greatest preachers I had ever heard up to that point. And I told God, I want to go to Great Lakes Bible Institute in Zion, Illinois. And God kept telling me Central Bible College. And I kept saying all summer, I want to go to Great Lakes Bible Institute. I actually got out of the Army in January. Wasn't going to school till September. And then... And then I got the catalog from Great Lakes Bible Institute, and I spread it out before God, said, I want to go here. Finally, God said, go. So I sent my application in, and it was accepted. I told everybody, I'm not going to Central Bible College. I'm going to Great Lakes Bible Institute in Zion, Illinois. The Sunday before I had to go to the Veterans Administration and tell them what college I was going to. Don't forget, in the 50s, we didn't have cell phones and stuff. All right. We had a speaker from Central Bible College, Wayne Fagerstrom. And the very first thing he said was, I've got good news. Great Lakes Bible Institute in Zion, Illinois, has just merged with Central Bible College, and all their students are going to Springfield. And God laughed at me and said, ha, ha, ha. The Bible says God works in us to want to and do of his good pleasure frequently. It was him giving me the want to to grow to Great Lakes because he knew what was going to happen with the two colleges. But I have God, had God speak to me so many times. When we were in Bible college, my wife and I wanted to get, we wanted to get married in June after the, first, after the first year of college. You couldn't get married during the school year. And we wanted to get married, and we set a date, and she was in a, men's prayer, a ladies' prayer meeting. I was in a men's prayer meeting. And the Lord spoke to both of us and said, yes, go ahead and get married, and you will have a church to pastor. Okay, now I was a young Christian. I wasn't slave when I was 19. At that time, I was 20, okay? And by the time I got married, I'd have been 21. So he says, okay, you're going to have a church to pastor. Well, every little church in the area, I'd go and preach at if it was available for a pastor, and they wouldn't vote me in because I wasn't married. I told them, well, I'm going to get married in June. No, you got to be married to be voted in as pastor. They were very small churches. Some of them had five or six people. Some of them had 15. And I was walking down the hall toward the end of the semester, and a guy stopped me. And he said, I've been pastoring at Frisco, Missouri, and I'm graduating. And God told me, you're supposed to follow me there. It was a church with 54 people. It even had a parsonage to live in. And they voted us in as pastors. We heard the voice of God say, you'll have a church to pastor when you get married. That was the first example. Okay, the first example. Another example has been so many over the years, okay? I was on my way to Guyana, South America, to preach a crusade in the polo grounds. And my son, who was nine years old, we were pastoring at you know, a church at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. My son, who was nine years old, wanted a Dallas Cowboy football outfit for Christmas. So I went to Sears to put it in layaway because it was October, and I wanted to be sure he got his Dallas Cowboy football outfit for Christmas. So I put it in layaway, which he used to be able to do, and pay pay on it between now and Christmas. And the Lord spoke very clearly and said, why buy him a Dallas outfit to wear in Kansas City? And I went home and told my wife, we're going to Kansas City. She said, no, because we didn't like Kansas City. We didn't tell another person, not one other person. Two years later, the church in Kansas City opened up. 
And we had been in the meantime gone to another church with a daycare center. And my wife got involved in the daycare center. God sent us there for two years. There was a problem had to be solved in that church. And God sent us down there for two years. Okay. And my wife worked in the daycare center. And then the church in Kansas City opened up and they called the superintendent of Missouri. We were in another state and said, we want, we need a man who's a strong preacher and a wife who can run the daycare center. And he gave them my name. We were pastoring a church full of multimillionaires and God led us to this inner city church with about less than 200 adults and about 100 bus children that owed everybody money. But we knew it was where God wanted us because he had told us four years earlier we were going to Kansas City. And we have been, now been in Kansas City for 51 years here at the same church. 33 years as senior pastor, since then as pastor emeritus. I still teach every Wednesday night. I preach when my son wants me to. Okay, I go to other churches and preach at other places. I'm now 92 years old, but I've seen God fulfill what he tells you he is going to do. And that has been our whole life. Yes, God can tell you to do things, but he will not tell you anything contrary to this book. Okay. He will not tell you to crash your airplane into a building. He will not tell you to harm and hurt innocent people. He will not tell you to do that. He will not do things contrary to this book. But I have learned to totally recognize the voice of God. And you, anyone can learn to recognize the voice of God, but you have to take time to listen. You have to be still and wait on God. I've never heard an audible voice. But yet I know when God is speaking to me in the same way the Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I'm a child of God and I know I'm saved. Okay. God won't direct every facet of our life, but he'll direct the important things if we take time to listen to him and hear the voice of God. The Bible says in Romans 8, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the children of God. He is talking about day by day living. You go to do something you shouldn't do as a Christian, and the Holy Spirit will tell you don't, okay? He will let you know you shouldn't do that. And then if you take, if you make it and take one step away from that, then he gives you the power to put it into practice. He never takes away your free will. And so you learn to live like that, to learn to recognize the voice of God. I think one of the best examples when I went in the army, they said you're going to be a high-speed radio operator. And they put the earphones on me. And I heard nine hours a day. A, da da beep, beep. B, da 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 beep, 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 beep. C, da 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 beep, 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 beep. Nine hours a day. And you had to type five-letter code words that were coming on a, t on a typewriter. You couldn't even see the keys. Okay? But, but, after, nine, but, but after lengthy, after weeks, they could put bagpipes in the background. Boop, 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 boop. They could put static in the background, and you could recognize that still voice. And that's exactly the way the voice of God is. You learn to recognize the voice of God. And again, God will not tell you to do anything contrary to this book. Yeah, that's why you have to know the word of God, because the enemy can put thoughts into your mind, too. Okay? The enemy can put thoughts into your mind. Okay, so uh, what do you say about other religions that have stories similar to Jesus' birth and virgin birth? They're just copied. Okay, they're just copies. But he's the only one that rose from the dead. They may have their stories, but they don't have the proof of a resurrection. The, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best attested facts in history. But to me, the biggest proof of the resurrection of Christ is people whose lives are daily being changed by Jesus Christ. I can look out at our congregation here, see people from every imaginable background, okay, whose lives have been changed by the power of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing what God does. Amazing what God does in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you speak on the different dispensations? I am not a strict dispensationalist. Okay, they try to divide everything into seven dispensations. Innocence, in the Garden of Eden, there was innocence. Okay, and then conscience came along. 
and then human government. Okay, the law came along, and then grace, and then the millennium's coming. Uh, I remember I, I remember I heard a preacher say years ago he was glad he went to seminary because that taught him the grid to put on scripture. Well, the problem with dispensationalism is that they say, well, God worked this way in this this in this age, but he only works this way in this age, and he can't work the same way he did in this age. And I think the whole thing is artificial. God can work any way he wants to in any age. The only part of dispensationalism that I personally accept is the fact that in the Old Testament, Israel is God's exhibit A. In the New Testament, the church is exhibit A and Israel is exhibit B. When the rapture of the church takes place, Israel will again be God's exhibit A on the earth. And the, the, the Great Tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time of restoration of Israel when they will recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But in the Garden of Eden, yes, they were innocent. And, and then when they sinned, they had conscience. But, 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 but the fact extreme dispensationalism, well, God performed miracles here in this dispensation, but now we're in the dispensation of grace, so God doesn't heal anymore, and God doesn't pour out his spirit anymore. No, God poured out his spirit in the Old Testament. God can pour out his spirit in the New Testament. God can pour out his spirit today. So that's why I'm not a radical dispensationalist. I think they put a grill on scripture that is totally unwarranted. Yes, God works in, he works in different ways, but he's not restricted because he worked that way in this age, not to be able to work that way in this age. And I think that's where dispensationists draw the line too sharply, too sharply, okay? And so, okay, I'm going to talk now about the marriage. Uh, uh, here's the question I was going to read last week, and I apologize at the end of the program for not discussing it. We had a visiting minister a couple of weeks ago, and he made several statements that if you've been divorced and remarried, you won't go to heaven. Could you respond? Yes, there's a false teaching that that is the unforgivable sin, that you're living in sin, and so on. Let me read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19. Now, all the Gospels give little bit of I know snippets about what Jesus said. Matthew 19 is the fuller explanation of what Jesus said on marriage and divorce, but there's other statements I want to read to you too. Number one, let me remind you, okay, that in Mark 3.28 and Matthew 12.31, it says, all manner of sin will be forgiven except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. All manner of sin. Every kind of sin can be forgiven except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And let me give you a story that happened at a church we pastored years ago, okay? And in that church, and I've used this before, many of you have heard it, we got a young couple that were in their second marriage with different people. They drove them away from the church. They didn't want them in their church. Now, I was a fairly new pastor. I'd only been there a few weeks when this happened, okay? And I didn't know if they were going to run me out of town or what. But I got up the next Sunday, and I said, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Every one of you have something in your past that God has not only forgiven, but he has forgotten. And if God forgets the sin of the past that you repent of, who do you think you are to dare bring it up again? Again, I didn't know if they were going to run me out of town or what, but everybody came to the altar, and we were in revival for the next seven years. Went through two building programs. It became one of the larger churches in the city because our people repented and prayed because there's only one sin that God will not forgive. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now let me read Matthew 19, okay? Because he goes further than all the other Gospels, starting with verse 3. And the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, there were two major rabbinical schools. The school of Hillel said you could put away your wife for any reason, any reason. Uh, the Old Testament said if you marry a woman and find... Uh, you know, an uncleanness in her, 
while essentially talking about sexual sin, but they translated an obnoxiousness. If she burns biscuits, if she has messy hair, you can put her away for any cause you want. All you had to do was get a couple witnesses and say, I put you away, I put you away, I put you away. You could do it for any cause. That was the school of Hillel. The school of Shammai said only for sexual impurity. That was the only way you could do that. So they're basically asking Jesus, which school are you in? Are you in the school of Hillel or the school of Shammai? What is your opinion? Be, okay. And he answered them, have ye not read him which made him at the beginning, made them male and female? And by the way, male and female, period, exclamation point. And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and his mother, and shall cleave into his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but one flesh, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. They said unto them, Why then did Moses command you to give her a writing and divorcement and put her away? And the Old Testament law allows you and allows them to do that. And he said, Because of the hardness of your hearts, in other words, because of the way you guys treat your wives, he allowed you to put away your wife, but from the beginning it was not so. I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. That means if there's immoral sexuality, okay? The word fornication is a Greek word pornography. It's actually porneia, the word we get our word pornography from. Any kind of sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman is called porneia in the Bible, okay? And shall marry another commits adultery. And whosoever marries her that puts away commits adultery. Okay, well, that's the end of the story. No, it isn't. Just keep reading. People stop reading here. His disciple, the head of the case of a man with a wife, is good not to get married. He said unto them, everyone cannot receive this saying except those to whom it's given. <laughs> now, understand the word eunuch basically means someone that is celibate, celibate without sexual relations. Well, there are some celibates which were so born from their mother's womb. There are some celibates which were made celibates of men, and there be celibates which have made themselves celibates for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that's able to receive it, let him receive it. In other words, just because you've been through a divorce does not mean you can necessarily be celibate the rest of your life, okay? And matter of fact, Paul tells us uh, in, the book of, in the book of 1 Corinthians, he tells them it's better to marry than to burn with passion, okay? Now, but let's go over and look at, and let's go over and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he first of all tells them, you know, Christians married to an unbeliever. If the unbeliever leaves, you're no longer longer the bondage of the marriage contract. Okay, so you're free. All right. And then he says this in verse, uh, my eyes are a little blurry. Okay. Uh, he says this in uh, in chapter 7, verse 27, are you bound unto a wife, okay? Are you bound to a wife? Seek not to be loose. The New American Standard Bible says released from a wife. Well, you know what the, you know what they say? They say, well, that means you don't wish you, you don't wish your wife to die. He doesn't talk about dying. He says, are you loose from a wife? Not has your wife died. They will not recognize what it says because they've got their pet legalism. Okay, are you bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. The Greek verb is luo, that means to loose or destroy. And again, the New American Standard says it right. Are you loosed from a wife? In other words, has there been a destruction of the marriage? All right, are you loosed from a wife? Okay, don't go about seeking a wife, but, and if you marry, you have not sinned. Oh, let's tear that out of the Bible. No, because everybody can't stay single the rest of their lives. I've seen situations back years ago. A you know, man would run off and leave a wife and three kids, and someone would come along that loved the woman and loved her children and won't want to get married. And I've seen pastors who wouldn't marry them because of this. Well, I did. I did because God forgives and God forgets the past. You know, this, this Bible talks about the sins of every person in here except Jesus. There's only, I don't know why we call it the good book. There's only one good person in it. Everybody else is just like us. He tells, shows the failures of people, but whose lives are changed by the power of God. He shows the failures of people even after they meet God. 
and God still forgives them and takes them through. Okay? God doesn't give up on people. I want you to say that to yourself. Say, God won't give up on me. He won't give up on you. Now, that doesn't mean you can live like the devil. And uh, right now on Wednesday nights, I'm teaching on 1 John. And he tells Christians, if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourselves. But he uses a, a one-time, uh, the way the Greek reads, a one-time action of sin. You're going to sin, you're going to sin until that day you stand in the presence of God. But he compares it with the, I know, with the habitual lifestyle of sinning. He uses a continuous action participle, continua, continually walking in the darkness. He, he that says he knows the Lord is continually walking in the darkness, is lying, not speaking the truth. But he also writes to Christians, these things are written to you that you won't sin. The Greek aorist tense, don't commit a single sin. But if you do, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sin and not for our, but the sins of the whole world. What's a propitiation? It's actually someone that takes the punishment in your place. And that's what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. But that doesn't mean you go out and live like the devil. Read First John. He tells you you can't keep doing that. You can't keep living that lifestyle. But he also reminds us that we won't be perfect until we see him as he is. Then we'll be like him. And he goes on to say, beloved, now we're the children of God. It doesn't yet appear what we shall be. But when, no, when he will appear, we will be like him. Or we'll see him as be his. But then he adds, everyone that has this hope in them keeps purifying themselves even as he is pure. It's a lifetime process of becoming. But as long as you have that attitude, yes, you're going to make it because God won't give up on you. But if you say, I can just go and live like the devil any way I want because God's grace. No, 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 you can't do that. And that goes along with this question I have here. I am new to listening to your weekly show on YouTube. I have two questions. Do you believe in eternal security? No. Okay. And, and, and I'll qualify that. And second, what are your views, thoughts on generational curses? Now, number one, there is no such thing as a generational curse in the New Testament. You cannot find Jesus praying for a generational curse. You can't find any of the apostles in the book of Acts praying for a generational curse. It is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it happened because it was people that influenced the whole nation of Israel, usually, okay? But by the Bible says, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. Now, the example of the parents is taught in the New Testament. Yes, make straight paths for your feet, okay? The primary purpose of, an, of, a, you know, of a parent, even Proverbs, train a child up in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart. That doesn't mean to tell them means to take them by the hand and show them. Okay, I like I like the statement, example is not the main thing in influencing people. It is the only thing. All right, and that, that, that's the way it is. Parents are to be an example, okay? They're to be an example to your children. I used to tell parents, your kids will do what you say, then they're going to reach a certain age, they're going to do what you do. So if you ignore churches because it's raining, they're going to do the same thing because they know you'd go to work on that day. Okay, if you don't, if you can't be bothered about Christian things, they will follow in your footsteps. Example, but not, not, okay, we don't, there is no such thing as generational curses. The only curse mentioned in the New Testament is where Jesus hung on the cross where it says, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. He bore the curse of the law for every human being, okay, that ever lived or ever will live. It's a matter of accepting that. Generational curses are not valid, okay? Now, un I actually call it unconditional eternal security. The main emphasis of the Bible, God's able to keep us, okay? God is able to keep us. I know we read what can separate us from the love of Christ, his tribulation or distress or persecution, okay, or any of these that can't separate us from the love of God. Well, the Bible says God so loved the world. He even paid the bill for people that he loves that are going to end up in hell. God loves every person he created. He wants them in heaven. That's why Jesus came to die. He died for every person from Adam, the last person that will ever live. Nothing can separate you from that love, but it can separate you from God for eternity. Sin. Sin can do that. But he's able to keep you. 
that's that, that's the main emphasis. Paul says, I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep my deposit against that day. Okay. Jude says, unto him that's able to keep it from falling and present you holy in holy. The Bible says in Colossians, he will present us holy, unblameable, and unnitpickable in his sight if we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Why does it well, why is the if there? He will present us holy, unblameable, and I've translated unnitpickable in sight, if we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. There are warnings in the Bible. What about in the parable of the sower, where Jesus indicated the sower went out to sow the seed? Some fell on stony ground, and it didn't grow. Some fell on ground with little root, grew for a while. But the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things choked it out, and it died. Okay? And it grew for a while. The Bible gives warning after warning after warning. John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch should not be that's not bearing fruit. He purns it that it may bring forth more fruit. Keep, he keep remaining in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit unless it remain in the vine, no more can you unless you remain in me. If a man does not remain in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them in the fire they're burned. Remain in me. He gave you that opportunity. And then just a couple of passages to remind you. Uh, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And chapter 10 should actually begin at 924. There's a lot of places in your Bible. Don't forget the chapters and verses were added, okay, in the Middle Ages. And they, they got them in the wrong places sometimes. They divide sentences and divide thoughts frequently. That's why I tell people when you read the Bible, ignore the chapters and verses, okay? They're there to help you remember where certain passages are. But we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, chapter 9. Paul makes a very strong statement in verse 24. Know ye not that they which are running in a race all run, but only one wins the prize. So keep running that you may obtain. Every man that strives for the gains is self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They got a laurel wreath. We an incorruptible crown. I therefore sold fight, not uncertainly, not, not, not as one that just beats the air, but I bring my body into subjection, lest after I've preached to others, I should be disqualified. Now, if you don't have the pre preconceived concept of eternal security, Paul is actually saying he'll be disqualified for heaven. And the word translated disqualified here is adakimos. That's the word translated reprobate all the way through the Bible, adakimos. I should be adakimos. And then he goes on to use the illustration how the children of Israel came out from Egypt on the way to Canaan, and they died in the desert. And it gives you all the things they died from, okay? It goes on to say, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the desert. Well, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted, neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. That means sexual things taking place. Okay, that yes, while Moses was getting the Ten Commandments, they made idols, and then they had this going on. That's from Exodus 33, and the first reference was from Numbers 11. Okay, neither, neither commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, 23,000. That was with the Moabitish women. Okay, neither, uh, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed as serpents. Neither murmur as some of them murmur were destroyed as destroyer. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not lie to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Why the warning here if it can't happen? Peter says in his epistle, you can be like the dog going back to your own vomit and the sow that was washed who was wallowing in the mire. And he uses the word epinosis for those that have personal experimental knowledge of God. 
Unfortunately, the translations don't make the difference between gnosis, head knowledge, and personal experimental knowledge. And gnosis can be used both, but epinosis is only personal experimental knowledge. Then if you read Hebrews chapter 2, calls them holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. Beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and apostatizing from the living God, no longer believing in Jesus. And then he goes on to use the same illustration about Israel starting out from Egypt to Canaan and not making it. Then in chapter 6, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened. And the word means to come to a point of becoming enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. That's Jesus. We're made sharers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the word of God. Good. And the powers of the world to come good and fell away to renew them to repentance, seeing they gave crucifying the Son of God afresh. Keep putting him to an open shame. In Hebrews chapter 10, after he says, stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, that much more as you see the day approaching. For if we keep practicing willful sin, continuous action, after we've received the epinosis, personal, intimate relationship, knowledge of the truth, there's no such thing as false epinosis in the New Testament. There remains no longer a sacrifice for our sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation as to the power of the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment shall he be thought worthy, who is trodden underfoot the Son of God, has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and then despite to the Spirit of grace, it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He goes on to say, The Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to have fallen into the hands of a living God. Yes, the main emphasis is God's able to keep us. Okay, on Christ's solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, and build your life on him. Yes, and you will fail as a Christian, but John says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and to keep forgiving our sin, as long as we're just not living in open sin. But the warning's there that it can happen, okay? It can happen. Why is the warning there if it can't happen? One author so believes in unconditional eternal security, he said these things are in the Bible in case it could happen, but it can't happen. Then why did God put it there? Is God so foolish to put something there that can't happen? No. He gives us warnings all the way through the Bible. People that had a touch of God on their lives and lost it. If David had not repented, that would have been the end for him, but he did repent. He repented, and God forgave him. As I say, I don't know why they call it the good book. There's only one good person in it. That's Jesus. Everybody else is just like us. But God will forgive. God will forgive, but you can't just keep living like the devil and think God's going to take you to heaven. He's not. He warns you. He warns you. Read First John. You can't keep walking in darkness. You can't keep practicing that sin. You can't keep it up. You got to stop it. How do you stop? You say no. You see, if you're a Christian, the power of God enables you to say no. What I tell people, the power of God is like the, the engine of my car. It's dynamic. Dynamic. And, you know, my car will go forward. It'll go backward. It, if I start to turn, it gives me more power to turn. If I try to stop, it gives me power braking. But I have to exercise that power and allow it to work in the car. And that's the same way with living with the power of the Holy Spirit. You make the decision. He enables you to do it. But the Bible does not teach unconditional eternal security. And I know a lot of my good brothers believe it. Now, if I preach at a church where I know the pastor believes in eternal security, I'm not going to get up there and preach against it. I've preached in, in different denominational churches all over the world. Okay, I've, uh, I've spoken in in Bible colleges, taught in Bible colleges all over the world. And I, I, when I'm preaching in a church, as far as I'm concerned, the pastor of that church is responsible for what that church believes. And if I have an area where I disagree with him, I won't preach on the area I disagree. I'll preach on the area I agree, centered around Jesus. We will all agree with that. We may, we may disagree in other areas, but we all agree that Jesus is the only way to God. As many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. And when you receive Jesus Christ, you know that you're saved. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. I can't explain how that works, but it works. 
I mean, you can't put it in words. You can't, you can't draw a diagram on it. You can try and show the Holy Spirit coming like this. That doesn't explain it. It still blows every fuse I have in my mind, but I know it's true because I know I have that assurance. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians. After you believe, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And that word translated earnest uh, in modern Greek, our abona is engagement ring, is the earnest of our inheritance till the redemption of the purchased possession. You get the engagement ring, and the Bible says there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb one day. The church is the bride of Christ. And both the Old Testament and New Testament saints, contrary to what a lot of the teaching. And so, yes, all these things are going to happen, but we have to know Jesus Christ personally, personally. I do not believe in unconditionally, I call it unconditionally eternal security. As long as you're willing to be saved, you can be saved, but you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. You can't just live like the devil and expect to stand in heaven. So often wonder why ministers and their families were moved around by the various denominations. I would not know because I'm a member of the Assemblies of God. And in the Assemblies of God, each local church is a sovereign body. Okay, ours is a cooperative fellowship. Now, if we, if we, start, if we begin to teach false doctrine, they can kick us out. But that they won't come in and say, you've got on such and such a Sunday to teach this. You know, on your properties in the name of the denomination. No, the local congregation owns the church. So I don't know why those ministers are moved around, but I know God does move you as pastors. And I've pastored seven churches over the years. Uh, the first church I pastored was only one semester at school because the Lord told me to resign and spend more time to my education. Uh, that's where we were driving 70 miles to and from school. But I still got to preach all around the Springfield area during that time. And then secondly, uh, he moved us to a church for three years. Okay. okay. When I got out of college, he moved us to a church for one year because I had to get a job at General Motors hauling batteries and generators up and down ladders because the church only had 13 people the first Sunday. And then he moved up, us up to the tip of the thumb in Michigan. We were up there for three years. That's where both of our natural children were born. And then we moved down to Kent, Missouri, in the boot heel. Then we moved to Cape Girardeau, Missouri, then to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and then to Kansas City. But again, I've been now at the same church in Kansas City for 51 years and seen God perform miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. It just couldn't happen what God has done. One illustration, we need to be, uh, you know, we're right in the city, okay? We're right down in the city. And, and I just want to tell you the miracles of God. That They've asked me to go to church growth conference and explain how to do this. And I tell them, I don't have the foggiest idea. I prayed and God did it. But when we came to Kansas City, it was all white church. We had a couple hundred people. Uh, we had less than 200 adults and we had about 100 bus children. Okay. And they came, but they were all white. And here we are in the middle of the city. And I looked at it and I and I know it was God working in me because I said, he gives us the want to. I said, God, we need to have a church that represents the kingdom. And the kingdom is not all white. Please give us a church that represents the kingdom. And it was that was my burden. That was my heartache. I knocked on doors. We invited people. We, we provided transportation. We made a way. And it wasn't working. And, and that burden was still there. And I kept asking God, please give us a church that represents the, the city, that the kingdom of God, represents the kingdom of God since we're in the city. And God eventually gave us the largest multicultural church in mid-America, okay? The largest multicultural church in mid-America. And we had several miracles. We had to buy a gas station next to our church, little church, because we ran out of room. Okay, we ran out of room. People were being saved. And we prayed, and they sold us the gas station for $2,500, for $25,000, when we found out they had a quarter million invested in it. And then, and then we built a gymnasium to seat 1,400, and we were having two services on Sunday and one Sunday night, and we became out of room again in the end of the late 90s, 1990s. And our parking lot was across the street and right next to it, a 13-acre sanitary landfill, right in the middle of the city. We didn't want to go out of the city. We wanted to stay in the city, okay? I grew up in Detroit, 
We want to stay in the city. I'm a city boy. And to me, that's, that's where the big need is for the gospel. And so, you know, you know that property, they wanted $550,000 for it. To make a long story short, the God gave it to us for $5,000. Then we didn't have the money to build. And the vice president of the bank came to me and said, we like what you're doing in the city. If you need to build, we'll loan you money way below prime. If your general counsel will take the note when we're finished and we got approval. So we built right across the street an auditorium to seat 3,000, a chapel to seat 500, educational office building in between. And our youth center is right across the street. Same location. Same location. Okay, it's all a miracle of God. And that's what God does. You need a miracle. He's a miracle working God, but he won't work on your timetable because I'm always in a hurry and God never is. I know when my son took over, I never knew how many people we had. And we helped start several other churches during the years. Uh, if someone felt they wanted to start a church, we would help them, send people out with them, finance them, and help them until they got the church established. We've always done that. And God just kept opening doors for us to do that. But, but my son said when he took over, the church was averaging 6,500. And I never noticed. He said, well, he just noticed that about 40% of the church is black, about 40% is white, about 20% was Hispanic and Asian and other people. That's what God did, folks. I don't know how to do any of that. I don't know. I tell people at pastor's conference, I don't know what I'm doing, but he knows what he's doing. He's the builder of his church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And remember, pastors, it's not your church. It's his church. He is the builder of the church. He's the only one that can change lives. Okay. He's the only one that can change lives. And so, you know, he can do that. And he can build his church. Uh, I had a sermon I preached years ago at conferences. Can he build his church? Yes, he can. He built his church. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the gates of hell have always tried to prevail against God's people, and they're still trying today. Uh, in Joshua 10, 12, did God stop the sun for Joshua? I think he probably refractured it. I reflected it, made it, I made it appear to be in the sky because God can do all kinds of things. My, my, he might have put like a big mirror in the sky so the sun stayed up there all day. I don't know how God did it, but I don't know how God does his miracles. I don't know how God created a billion times a billion worlds by speaking the word. I don't know how God did anything. I don't know how God put my sin on his son and changed my life 2,000 years. <laughs> he paid my bill 2,000 years ago and then made it applicable to my life when I was 19. And that's why I can tell people, I don't care where you've been, what you've done. I don't care what sin you've committed. If you receive Jesus Christ, God will not only forgive your past, he will totally blot it out. It will be non-existent no matter what you've done. No matter how many times you've failed God, it will be non-existent. And First John says if we're walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ is continuously cleansing us from all sin. That's not for the practice of sin. That's for the occasional sin. Yes, it's one thing to sin and say, God, help me to be stronger next time. But it's another thing to say, well, I can just keep doing this because of the grace of God. No, no, no. You need to read First John. You can't keep walking in the darkness. You can't keep doing that. But whatever God did, it was a miracle. Uh, I don't believe he had to stop the rotation of the earth. He could have just put a big mirror up there. And he could have just had everything stand still and let the earth rotate and the sun move with it. Who knows how God did it? I don't know how God creates. I don't know how God does anything. I've already explained I can't understand the Trinity, but I know it's true. And it's true. I, I, I get, the more I read the Bible, the more I see what God does, I get overwhelmed by him. I do. I, I get absolutely overwhelmed. I, 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 I haven't taught on 1 John uh, since I taught Greek in college. Okay. And it's, because the whole first year, all I taught students was grammar. Then I let them translate 1 John because he makes such a big deal of the continuous action of the present tense as opposed to what's called the aorist tense, a one-time action. And the book of 1 John shows the usage of that consistently. Yes, you're going to sin. If you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar, okay? He's writing to Christians, my little children. But if the practice of sin, you can't do that. 
if you're practicing sin, you're still walking in the darkness. And if you say you know God, you're a liar. That's what he says. But I get overwhelmed with, with God. I get overwhelmed with him all the time. When I see all the things he's done and all the amazing things he does for people today, he's still doing miracles, folks. And he can change your life. He can transform you by his power. I was glad to see, uh, you know, all the date setters were disappointed again. But, but they, they, they always come on the scene when there's an eclipse or a, a blood moon or anything like that. You can't use anything like that to set dates. You know, Jesus talks about his return. He said, it's not for you to know. And if Jesus said it's not for you to know, you're not going to figure it out in any way possible. You can try all you want. You can use mathematics. You can use everything. You're going to figure it out. You're just not going to do it. How do you explain John 3, 9? Let me turn over here to 1 John. I can four chapters and verses. Okay. Let me get over here to 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever remains in him doesn't sin. It's continuous action verb. Is not sinning would be a better translation. Okay? Is not sinning. It's not aorist. It's continuous action. That's the tenses that I taught people about. It's very critical in this book. That's why I had them translate this book. The Greek present tense implies continuous action, but John frequently uses participles, which overemphasize the continuous action. And you don't practice it. Is not sinning. Okay, he's not sinning. And so it doesn't, but, but he's already said, if you're a Christian, you're going to commit a single sin. If you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar. And he's writing to Christians. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. He's writing to Christians. But it's the practice of sin, the continuous, the idea of keeping, the idea of keeping doing it. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. How does Paul's experience of joy in the midst of suffering challenge our own attitude toward hardship and adversity? What spiritual disciplines or attitudes can help cultivate a sense of joy and contentment and love? Okay, Paul Paul has been whipped with a cat of nine tails. Oh, okay, he has been beaten with rods. He's been whipped five times, beaten with rods three times. He'd been thrown in prison many times. He said, I bobbed up and down like a cork in the Mediterranean Sea for a day and a half. That's not exactly the King James Version, but that's what he said. I've been in danger of false brothers. Why? What does he say? What does he call all that? This light affliction. What? Prison, whipping, beating, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more eternal, exceeding weight of glory. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul had the vision of the future. This life is temporary, folks. You're going to go through difficulties. Jesus did. Every hero or heroine of faith went through difficulties. Read Hebrews 11. You know, he pictures this big coliseum of them watching us run a race. I don't think they're watching. He's drawing a picture, but he calls them witnesses, not spectators. All those that he mentions in Hebrews chapter 11 are, are, are witnesses that you can finish this race in victory, no matter what you go through. And he talks about how they were persecuted, sawn asunder, all kinds of bad things happened to them. Christians are being persecuted all over the world tonight. And cheer up, it's coming here if the Lord tarries. Okay. And it's, it's going to happen. Because people don't like the morality that the Bible teaches. Think they can live any way they want. And there's a God up there who loves us so much. No, God says you can't do that. And he spells out sin for us in his word. you got to take this book. I tell people your argument isn't with me. It's with this book. It's with God that gives, out, that gives these principles and these truths in his book. Okay. And he says you won't make it. He wants you to. The Bible says twice he's not willing that one soul should perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. You know, there's a teaching of predestination that God predestines who's going to heaven and he's going to hell and you don't have a choice. 
then why does the Bible say twice, it's not God's will that one soul should perish? Why is the last message of the Bible say, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that's here say, come, let him that's thirsty come, and whosoever wants to, come and drink of the water of life freely. Well, they say you won't want to unless you're predestined. That started with Augustine in the fourth century. That is not true. What do you think of the eclipse? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. An eclipse is a natural phenomena that happens every year somewhere in the world. It went across the United States uh, in 2017. It is not a sign of the end time. There have been eclipses ever since creation. And it happens every year somewhere in the world, sometimes as many as four times. And it's like the blood moons. They are natural phenomena, things that are going to happen. The things that happen in the book of Revelation are not natural phenomena. There are things that happen that are obviously miracles and judgments from God. And the coming of an eclipse is not signaling anything at all. <clears throat> nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. But as I said the week before it happened and two weeks before it happened, nothing was going to happen. And the date setters were out again. Oh, my. They were telling it was actually going to go over uh, there's little towns named Rapture it was going over all these little cities named Rapture. I said, so what? It's a natural phenomena, okay? And it's not a, a particular miracle. So, uh, you know, we have to look at the things in Revelation that are not natural phenomena, not natural phenomena. There's going to be more eclipses if the Lord tarries, okay? Um, but it does not imply any kind of judgment or anything else. It's just a natural phenomenon. The moon gets between the earth and the sun. It's been doing it for thousands of years, and it's going to keep doing it if the Lord tarries. But people get all upset about it, all excited about it. Now, it's interesting to watch it happen. I know my daughter, my oldest daughter, lives in Dallas, and she sent me a video because it really got, you know, there it was totally eclipsed. We just saw partial here. But it's interesting to watch, but it has no spiritual significance. Now, when the moon is turned to blood in the book of Revelation, it is not an eclipse. It's a miracle of God taking place. Whoops. Dropped it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, yes. Uh, does the Bible go, Bible and science go hand in hand? The facts of science, not the false hypotheses. There's some very good websites on science and the Bible that science has not disproven one thing in the Bible, okay? And the facts of science back up everything the Bible says. And the, and the hypotheses such as evolution, and the age of the earth, and all those kind of things. By the way, the Bible does not say the earth is only 4,000 years old. Okay? Uh, well, the earth is only 6,000 years old. No, no, no. No, that's a fallacy. Uh, uh, that was a fallacy of a man by the name of Usher who added up the genealogies and came out with 4,004 B.C. for creation. When actually so-and-so begat so-and-so just means it became the ancestor of the next person that mentioned. It may, he may be his father, but he may be his great, 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 grandfather. And just say so-and-so begat so-and-so. That's that's why David is called the father. Oh, okay. The David is called the father of Jesus. Jesus is called the son of David. Well, that's a thousand years later. Thousand years later. And so the begat simply means at a point in time they became the ancestor of the next important person, and you can't add up the genealogies and come up with the age of the earth. Now the group of people called the geochronologists who claim the earth is somewhere between 20, uh, is somewhere between 12 and 20,000 years old. And they have all kinds of things that they base that on. And so it's, uh, you know, but, but, but the facts of science do not disagree with the Bible. Matter of fact, they have the opposite effect. Uh, someone asked, how come every nation has a flood story? Well, because we're all descendants of Noah. <laughs> we're all descendants of Noah. I don't care where you live in the world, you go back to Noah. 
And, the, and most of them are local flood stories. And the Bible tells us it was worldwide. Yeah, they all go back. That's why every nation has a flood story. And the eclipse was just another natural event. And you can't get overly excited about it. Uh, that was good to, good to hear. That was from Jerry. That was from Jeremy in Monterey, Mexico. Yeah. They have a the great ministry down there, Christ for the Nations in Monterey. Do you need a business mind to run a church? Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's why we have, as, as soon as I was able, we had a full-time business manager. As soon as I was able. Now, now, the first few churches, my wife and I had to do it. However, my wife had been an accountant for a real estate agent, okay, as a teenager. All right. She kept the books for a large real estate agent. And when I first, uh, before I got saved, okay, I, I was an office boy in the General Motors department in, De, uh, in the General Motors building in Detroit. And the whole 13th floor was the financial floor. And I started to go to night school, learn business law and accounting. And, uh, and I, and I'd take the bus to night school three nights a week and then go home on the bus from there. And so, so I had a little bit of business, but I still, when, when we got big enough, one of the first things I thought we needed was a business manager. I was really fortunate that God gave me administrative assistants who were also excellent on business. So I basically let them run that part of the church. Now I also would not, pastor a church without a board to set the financial policy of the church. I tell young pastors, there's two things you keep your hands off. You keep your hands off the money and you keep your hands off the opposite sex. And the very first thing, the board made the financial decisions. Okay. They set the policy. In other words, right now, our church, of course, is very large. It has been for many years now. And the board would set the policy. In other words, if I had the pastor would meet a missionary, the board would set a range that I could make a pledge to that missionary. Or if we hired a new staff member, the board would set the range and allow me to set the actual salary. And that's been the policy. I, w I would not want to pastor a church without someone else to handle the finances. And again, we had to do that in our first two or three churches because they did not have a board. I was delighted when I finally got a board that was handling the finances and got a custodian to clean the church. <laughs> when I got my first custodian to clean the church so I didn't have to do it all, I almost thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Because my second church had 13 people the first Sunday. The next one had about 50 people. I was also a custodian. The one after that, I was custodian. But then I got one where I wasn't the custodian. And that was great. That was great. Yes. Yes, you need to have a good business mind. And so you can have people. Ask God to send you people. You don't want people just like yourself. Uh, let me give a clue to pastors. You don't want clones. You want people that have different abilities and skills that you have. I remember when I got my first associate pastor here, and they said, but he's so different than you. I said, if he wasn't different than me, I wouldn't need him here. Okay? Get people that have abilities and skills that you don't have and allow them to do their job. Allow them to do their job. You know, one of the hardest things you have to learn as a pastor is to delegate. That was Moses' problem. He got so frustrated and upset with the people. He got mad at God. Who am I that you lay all this people on me? Have I given birth to them that you say then carry as a nursing father into the land that you swear to their father? Kill me. Get me out of your sight. Well, fortunately, God ignored him. But Moses had to learn to delegate. He took the spirit on Moses and put it on the elders. He had to learn to delegate some of the responsibility. And I remember one pastor telling me, well, I don't delegate because I can do it better than them. I said, well, Jesus could do it better than the apostles, but he still sent them out. How are they going to learn? How are they going to learn if you don't get You know, there's a step process. You walk with someone, okay? And then you walk behind someone. And then you have them report to you. And then you can eventually turn them loose. You can train them, but allow them to do their job. Allow them. 
Uh, I'm trying to think who it was. An American president made the statement, the secret to success is finding something you wanting done, finding someone can do it and have enough sense to keep your hands off them and let them do it. And that's one of the hardest things to learn as a pastor. One of the hardest things. Now you can do too much that way too, because you still have to be the captain of the ship, but you don't have to micromanage. You know, we do have to operate at functionally as a business. Right. But if you're going into it just as a business, you probably ought to do something else. Yes. It's a called ministry. Right. We're there to reach people for God. We have to operate under the right. law and be accountable. But if you're looking into it as a business venture, right. you're looking into the wrong thing. Right. If you look at the church as a business venture, you're doing the wrong thing. Your purpose is a call of God to get the gospel out. You still have to have someone take care of the business side that has a heart for ministry. Always have a heart for ministry. Everything revolves around ministry. Reaching people with the good news of Jesus. Reaching people. Helping missions around the world. And, uh, and you know that's what churches do. Help missions around the world. While I'm on that, let me encourage you to be faithful to your church. Okay, you need, to, you need to be back in church if you're watching online. The book of Hebrews says, Stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. That much more as you see the day approaching. Then he goes on to warn about the dangers of willful sin. Now, we need that time together. There's something about being in a service where the Spirit of God is moving. Did, did you know that 90% of anyone that ever receives Jesus Christ it's in a church? because a friend invites him to church. So if you want your church to grow, take somebody to your church with you this Sunday that's not going to church. Say, come hear our pastor preach. Come meet the people at our church. Come and join in on the worship service. I'll take you out for lunch if you go to church with me Sunday. <clears throat> okay? And, and that works. And be faithful in tithing to your church and giving offerings to your church. The first tenth is God's. The book of Malachi says that goes into the storehouse. Tithing was in existence hundreds of years before the law. Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek about 2000 BC. The law came about 1447 BC. Okay. Even Jacob, the lying crook, trying to make a bargain with God, he said, I'll even give you the tenth. He knew the first tenth belonged to God. That's not ours to decide what to do with. That goes where you go to church, not to some televangelist. Okay, and then I'm sure your church has missionaries that need support around the world. That's one of the things that bothers me. We get calls daily from people wanting to go to the mission field. <laughs> and we wish we had more budget for that purpose and all the other things. But we need you need to tithe to your church and give special offerings. You know, Second Corinthians eight and nine talks about giving. It actually talks about you know, being a cheerful giver. He's not talking about the tithe. He's talking about extra offerings. Uh, and we're actually told he was making up an offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem at the time. And that's what they are to pray about. He tells the Corinthians and Romans the same thing, to make up the special offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And so, but, but missions is vitally important. God is blessing America only, I think, because we're getting the gospel out around the world. If we ever stop getting the gospel out, do you think God's going to put up with all this garbage that's going on in our country with all this pure nonsense and anti-Christ and anti-Christian, anti-Israel stuff that's going on? Do you think God's going to put up with that? He never has any nation before. And the only reason I think we're being blessed is that we are getting the gospel out to other countries in the world. But there's going to come a time when that'll stop if the Lord tarries. So be faithful to your church with tithes and offerings and be faithful in attendance, and get back in the house of God, because you need the strength that comes from being there. You need the strength. Okay, well, let okay, me take some more of these questions. Can I get all these? Yeah. Okay, I talked about that. Paul's joy in the middle of difficulties. His joy in the middle of difficulties. What does the Bible say about legalism? How can a Christian avoid falling into the trap of legalism? Isn't it sometimes the thing the Bible says is sin and legalism, especially in an I society, was very liberal and everything is okay? Well, if the Bible calls sin, sin, it is sin, okay? 
and some but but some people harp on a particular sin. They're always going, yeah, 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 you're doing this, yeah, 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 yeah. Not gonna reach anybody that way. You need to tell them that God loves you and he can set you free from that. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, he will set you free. Jesus paid your bill to forget your past and to give you the ability to live as God wants you to live. Okay. I know on, a number of years ago they had a whole I, well, they had a local TV series on what they called the mega churches. Then there were about five, you know, churches that they showed on the on the TV. Okay, we got the second most time because the uh, the news anchor was attending our church at the time. Another church in town got uh, uh, he got more. They got more than we did because the owner of the station went to that church. But but they asked a lot of our people, why do you go to that church? And a lot of the answers were, well, because it's multicultural, because of the preaching, because of what we're taught. But person after person said sin is called sin, but in love. There's no doubt that it's called sin. But God came to set people free, and he loves you and wants to set you free. That's the message of the gospel. Not, nye, 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 nye. You're not going to win anybody that way. Yes, you have to call sin, sin. You do. But people get hung up on all different kinds of legalisms. Well, you got to keep the Old Testament Sabbath day. No, you don't. The early church worshiped on what they called the Lord's Day. And that was the first day of the week, Resurrection Day. Well, you got to worship on Resurrection Day. No, you read 1 Corinthians, uh, you read Romans 14 and 15. Paul said it doesn't matter what day you worship on. And he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we get all upset on, on our legalism. His one man has a restricted diet. Another one eats everything. Well, if he if he if he eats herbs, let him eat herbs, but don't criticize the guy that's eating everything. And the guy that's eating everything, don't criticize the guy that's eating herbs. But you do have to still call sin sin. And you can harp on things that don't matter. Okay. You can harp on things that don't matter. The Bible's very clear on what is sin. And we're living in an age when people want to deny it. Churches deny it. They don't want to accept the word of God. They want to accept what it says. And they're doing all kinds of things contrary to the Bible. And God's going to eventually judge for that. But our society is very liberal. Everything's okay. We do have to call sin, sin. We have to read what the Bible says and let people know. Any kind of sex out of sight of marriage between a man and a woman, the Bible calls porneia, sin. And the Bible's very clear on it. It's not doubting that. But you can't just harp on that all the time. You need to let people know God loves you and God wants to forgive you and God wants to change your life. That's the purpose. But people get legalism about what day to worship. They get legalism. In the Old Testament, you couldn't eat pork. Uh, well, well, you, you got to watch your diet. No, no. It's not what the Bible's talking about anymore. Okay, in First and Second Samuel, how do we reconcile God's sovereignty with the suffering and moral failings depicted in the narrative, such as the death of Samuel's sons or David's adultery with Bathsheba? How do we understand the authority of the role of the prophets like Samuel and Nathan, particularly in challenge or rebuking the action of kings? Yeah, that's what that's what that's what happens. I preached on David a couple of weeks ago at a church, and uh, one thing I mentioned about David. You know, you know, David, the giant killer, the I killed Goliath, the sweet singer of Israel, Israel, the great psalmist. And uh, but then he saw Bathsheba. OK, OK, OK. Gave the wife of Uriah the Hittite taking a bath on her roof. And by the way, you read the Bible. God puts no blame on Bathsheba. It's all on David. He happened to see her. Couldn't be blamed for seeing her the first time. Jesus said, whosoever keeps looking at a woman for the purpose of, uh, uh, whosoever keeps looking in order to lust. Okay, it's committed adultery. In order to, that's the little geek word there, hina, in order to. Young man looking at young woman says, wow, she's gorgeous, I'd like to date her. That's not what he's talking about, all right? But it keeps looking in order to lust, and that's what David did. He ended up adultery and murderer. But David truly repented. He took, he said, it's my fault. Read the 51st Psalm. He took the blame. And he does not say, this is one place the New American Standard gives in to Calvinism. I'm a born sinner. That is not what it says. 
I was shapen in iniquity and in sin. In other words, I was born in the midst of this, and I finally gave in to it. Okay, it doesn't say I was born with it in me. It's not what it says. That's how Augustine took it to read. That's how Calvin took it to read. That's not what it says. He's just saying I was born surrounded by this, and I gave in to it. But he confessed it was all his fault and repented, and God forgave him. And when God forgives, God forgets, and Solomon is born. Yes, God forgives. You know, it's like when God told Abraham, you're going to have a son, and he, <laughs> he laughed. He said, tell Sarah, Sarah, you're going to have a son. <laughs> oh, when you laugh, he was, he was almost 100, and she was 90. And God asked Sarah, why'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. But when you read the New Testament, this side of Calvary, it says Abraham believed God. Sarah believed God. Why? Because God forgets the failure of the past. And he's forgotten your failures. The only one who remembers your past sins are you and your friends in the devil. And, the, the, and your friends in the devil are good about reminding you. But God forgives. That's what I said earlier. The Bible's full of people just like us and the grace of God that ultimately changes people. God won't give up on you. But if you just go out and keep walking in the darkness, yeah, 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 yeah. Read First John. You're lost. You're lost. Why were the disciples surprised by Jesus' resurrection after Jesus had told them repeatedly to expect it? An angel even reminded the women that Jesus had told them of his impending resurrection. How is it the woman remembered his words, but the disciples didn't when they had spent so much time with him? They should have known. Why? Because they, weren't ex they were still expecting him to lead the revolt and drive Rome in the, the coming Messiah is going to be the king, going to make Israel the head and not the tail. You read in John's gospel after he fed the 5,000 beside men, women, and children, says they came to make him king. Jesus sent the apostles across the sea, get out of here. In other words, here's the Messiah. Let's march on Jerusalem. Let's get rid of the Romans. Here's the king. Jesus, uh, he departed into a mountain to pray. Don't you imagine the disciples were discouraged? Well, we thought it was him. And here they wanted to do it. They wanted to storm Jerusalem, and he wouldn't do it. He must not be. But what did he do? He came walking on the water to let them know who he really was. But, but they, they were still expecting him to be the king. False expectation. They didn't expect our Messiah to go to the cross. They want the Messiah that's going to rule. That's still future. But that is coming, folks. It absolutely is coming. It's coming. Uh, can you explain Romans 14, 22, 2? Romans 14, 22. I think I know what that says, but I better look it up to be sure. Get my pages in my Bible turned over here. 1422. There's 12, 13, 14. Now, again, you know, chapter 14 and 15 is where he is arguing uh, one man keeps one day above another, another man keeps every day alike. Just be persuaded in your own mind. Be persuaded in your own mind. Now, what he says in 1422. Oh, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he that, con that condemns not himself in the thing which he allows. But he that doubts is judged if he eat because it is not of faith and whatsoever is not of faith of sin. Now, what does that mean? Well, the whole context is some people are only eating herbs. Other people are owning big meals. If you have it in mind that you shouldn't be eating that big meal it, and you have a conviction in your mind, okay, okay, you're doubting that it's right for you to eat that, that's the only context where this is used, okay? Then you shouldn't eat it. If you eat it, you're being judged because you're going contrary. But it goes on to say if you think it's okay to eat it, and, 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 and go ahead and eat it. If you think you have to eat herbs, you better just eat herbs. You try to eat something else, and your conscience is going to tell you it's wrong. That's the whole issue here. You got to read the whole chapter and see what he's talking about. Whatsoever is not a faith of sin. If you know you shouldn't do something, then don't do it. Now, I've mentioned before, I was a professional magician when I got saved. 
And when I was 19 years old, I started when I was 10. I used to, okay, but I had to give it up because it was first in my life. If I'd have gone back to it right away, it would have been a sin for me because God told me to give it up. Years later, it didn't have any place in my life, and the young people found out I used to do it. And so I borrowed some equipment from a, uh, from a magic company because I could explain to them how to do everything. Okay, we used to do it in our kids' crusade. Used to saw my son in half and float him in the air, float daughters in the air. Uh, someone made me a sword cabinet. You could put someone in and stick swords all through it. Or they made me a, a woman without a middle. You could see her face and her legs, but her middle would disappear. Uh, and we had a cabinet maker that could make all that equipment for me for almost nothing. But I used it to illustrate the gospel, but it didn't have any place in my life. But had I done it back when I was 19, after the Lord said, don't do it, I could not do it by faith. And so it depends on, as the same way with eating meat or not eating meat. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Well, I'm about out of time. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, he's knocking at the door of your heart. And they laid me in this prayer the night I got saved. And the young man said, I want the young man to give a testimony. I said, what's that? He said, what's God done for you? I said, I don't know, but something happened. It was my first time in that church. I didn't know that I could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I was religious. Went to church every Sunday, recited the Apostles' Creed. Okay, said the Lord's Prayer, sang the doxology, but I didn't know Jesus. Paul talks about his religious credentials in Philippians, and he says, I threw them to the dogs that I might know Christ. And he's, he has a word. He's trying to find the difference between knowing Jesus Christ and having religion. And our King James Bible says, yea, therefore, I count all things but lost. But Paul starts, he's looking for some kind of a sentence, explain the difference between having religious credentials and, and knowing Jesus. He starts the sentence in the original, but therefore, indeed, at least even. That doesn't make sense in any language in the history of the world. Okay, for the pastors, it's Allah menun gat kai. Allah menun gat kai. But therefore, indeed, at least even. That doesn't make sense in any language in the history of the world. But Paul is lost for words. The difference between having religious credentials and knowing Jesus. You know how I translate those five words? Wow. That's the difference when you meet Jesus. You pray this prayer, he'll meet you right now. As he's knocking at the door of your heart. Repeat after me. Father, I ask you to forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. Everything I am, everything I hope to be, I give to you. Save me right now. Help me to live for you from now on. Help me to understand the Bible. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church. Help me to tell others about your love. Thank you for loving me and paying my sin bill and forgiving my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray you'll confirm this in people's hearts. Lead them wherever they live to a good Bible-believing church. Wherever you live, there's good Bible-believing churches around. So find one that believes the Bible and gives people an opportunity to receive Jesus. If you're in the Kansas City area and you don't have a church home, uh, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We have service at 9 and 11 on Sunday. We have a place for every member of your family in every service. Okay, and then we have family night on Wednesday nights, and that's from 7 o'clock to 8.30. Okay, we have, we have our nursery open. We have children's services. And then we have youth services. We have young adult, 18 to 35. We have marriage works for married couples. And then I'm currently teaching on First John in the main auditorium. Okay. And there's a place for every member of your family. Uh, Sheffield is located in the city. Okay. We have Kansas City police officers, Jackson County sheriffs outside. It's safe. And uh, we're very secure. But you can check the website at SFLC. That's for Sheffield Family Life Center, sflc.net, and that's information. And you can send questions for next week to drgwwjr at gmail.com, drgwwjr, Dr. George W. Westlake, Jr., at gmail.com. 
And we'll look forward to answering the questions next week. Tell other people about this program and be faithful to your church this week. In Jesus' name, take someone with you. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.